Welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron, live interactive Bible study. We're a leader led by Pastor Douglas Banks out of Columbia, Maryland, and our facilitator is Minister Brenda Robb from Northern California. We're currently studying the book of Revelation. Come on in, have a seat, and study with us. Good morning, Heavenly Father. We thank you again for another one of your marvelous days. Father, you are so gracious and so merciful that you allowed us to get up this morning, to come on this line, to study more about you. Father, you tell us in your words to study ourselves, study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, but can rightly divide the word of truth. So as we come this morning, Father, humbly, Lord God, we bow down before your throne of grace and mercy, Father God. And we lift up the name of Jesus. Father God, we ask you to pour out your spirit upon us, Father God. Be in our midst, Father God. It says when two or three are gathered together, you are there, Father. And we know that you're listening to us, Father God. So let your Holy Spirit expound, Father God. Let him pour out. Let, let us receive what you have for us. Let us re- receive a manifestation of your glory, of your presence, Father. And we'll be so grateful to give you praise, glory, and honor. Father, if we draw closer to you, draw closer to us, Father God. As we pray to you, Father God, honor our prayers, Father God. Father, it says if we seek you first, your kingdom and your righteousness, that all things will be added, Father God. So, Father God, we're asking you to add to us, Father, to all the Lord God, if we spend time with we as we spend time with you, Father God. I just ask you to show us favor, Father God. Oh, God, show us your marvelous works, Father God, that we can also go out and begin to spread the good news of the gospel, to let others know that Jesus is still alive, Father God, and that his word is true. And we just thank you again for the opportunity to come on this line. Now, I ask you, Father, right now, bless the man of God, Father God. Continue to pour into him, Father God, as he pours out to us. Father, let him not get weary in well-doing, but let him continue on to the prize of the higher calling. So that mark, Father God. Continue to anoint him, and we just thank you for him, Father God, and the blessings that he blessed us with. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Um, thank you, Minister Brenda, and for covering us and keeping us and causing us to uh, turn once and again towards the Lord our God. Uh, thank God for each and every one of you. This is uh, Christmas week, uh, so I want to, uh, from our house to your house, we want to say the blessings of God be upon your entire household, uh, from the youngest to the oldest, from the closest to the furthest, from Jesus Christ. We want to uh, pray for the light to touch each and every one. Uh, we thank you for coming. We thank you for caring. Uh, and we are going to ask the Holy Spirit to continue to cover us under the prayer of our minister and cause us to be one uh, with one another, and uh, more especially one in Christ Jesus. So we are uh, in the book of Revelation. Uh, We are coming to chapter 7, and we've gone through 6, and we've seen the opening of the seals. Uh, Jesus Christ has opened the six seals, um, and uh, we know that the Antichrist will take advantage during this period and try to come as a man of peace, uh, a peace that uh, he offers the world without God. Uh, The unity, the unifying force, will be in humanism, not in God. Uh, Humans are moral, humans are capable, humans are able to advance and become all that they should be. Uh, They don't necessarily need a God to do that. For me, uh, that likens the number 666, which is the number of mankind. So if you're going to lift up mankind as the ones who are able to to bring themselves into whatever they need, um, then that links me to 666. And so this is uh, what he's going to do. And, and, and the problem with that is that when mankind tries to uh, lift themselves up according to their own standards uh, and their own uh, ability, uh, the next thing that comes is war and famine 
and uh, much death and, and poverty, bloodshed will accompany us. This takes me back to the 16th century when uh, this guy called Erasmus uh, stood up against Martin Luther. Erasmus said, listen, uh, Luther, you just uh, have it wrong. Mankind is noble. Mankind is able. Mankind has the word of God, so we know what's right and what's wrong, so we can uh, follow that according to our own senses, our own intelligence, our own logic, our own ability to uh, follow the word of God, and we can take care of ourselves. We can grow stronger, better, and higher. Uh, and this reminds me, of course, of the, tab- uh, the, the Babylon uh, uh, Tower, the Tower of Babel, rather. <clears throat> and it reminds me of Star Trek or Star Wars, that if you just leave mankind alone, they are noble, they are capable, and they will come through. And he had these great debates with Martin Luther. Martin Luther said it's not going to happen that way, for unless you surrender to the grace and the mercy of God, unless you recognize that mankind cannot do it by himself, but they must accept a Messiah uh, who is able to extend unto them the love of God, Mankind will never reach it depending on mankind. So uh, that was Martin Luther's argument saying that we need a savior, and we need a savior to be saved. And Erasmus's argument was, no, not really. We can grow in nobility by the logic of our own uh, uh, advance, by the logic of our own minds and our own nobility. Okay, so we know that when that happens, we're going to get into war, disagreement, fighting, and sin. I want to uh, use an illustration this morning that is akin to what happens when the Antichrist comes and teaches us this Erasmus theory, this peace according to mankind, this peace that if we just all get along, everything is going to be all right. And it is, and Jesus then unleashes the first six seals. And the, the first six seals I want to illustrate is equivalent to uh, World War II. The first three and a half years will be like the conventional warfare that we had uh, in World War II against uh, Germany and against uh, Japan, and, and, and it was just conventional warfare. And the first three and a half years that we depend on ourselves uh, uh, is going to be like that. But in the middle of this war, in World War II, the United States uh, dropped uh, atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well, when we get into the second three and a half years, it's going to be God who drops something that's much greater magnitude uh, than the atomic bomb. He's going to drop the wrath of God on uh, the earth. And it's going to be a complete change, that second three and a half years. You thought the first three and a half years was bad uh, in convention. The second three and a half years is going to be on a whole nother level, unveiling the wrath of God. Um, And the Antichrist, as he has been taking us through the first three and a half years, telling us that we really don't need God, that humanism will get us through, that if we just dig down into the nobility and the logic of our humanity, we will prevail. When that begins to fall apart uh, in war and famine and poverty and bloodshed and great death, then he will switch and say, okay, yeah, I was wrong. You do need a God. Absolutely, you do need a God, and that God is me. He will declare himself God. Um, And uh, that brings us to where we are in the opening of the seventh seal. Uh, The opening of the seventh seal is an interlude. It uh, It is a time when God stays his judgment. The first six seals have been opened. There is war, there is famine, there is poverty, there is all of this going on. And then God sends uh, an interlude in chapter 7. That's what we're going through now. Those who rejected Jesus Christ will yet be saved. Even though the first six seals have devastated the earth, there is this pause in chapter 7 where God saves many Jews. He saves many, I should say Hebrews. 
because the only real Jews that we know today are those in uh, Israel and places like that that came from the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. But the other ten tribes we really don't know, except we know that they were Hebrews, all Hebrews. And we know that these, uh, these Hebrews, 144,000 of them, will be saved evangelists, and they will evangelize the true word of God, Jesus Christ as Messiah. And not only them, but innumerable, uncountable Gentiles will receive the word of God, will receive Jesus Christ during this time, and will be saved. So in this, uh, this low in judgment, we find this 144,000 saved, and then innumerable multitude of Gentiles through the teaching of the gospel also saved. I want to clarify those ten northern tribes of Hebrews, and I'm going to call them Hebrews. That's exactly what they were. There's ten northern uh, tribes of Hebrews that were scattered in 721 B.C. by the Assyrians. They were scattered, the Bible says, throughout the world. They were scattered to Europe. They were scattered to Asia. They were scattered to Africa and eventually uh, to America. So we don't know who they are. God knows. But this British idea that all of the scattered uh, tribes of Israel wound up in Great Britain uh, is absolutely nonsense. It's not backed up by the Bible, and it's not backed up uh, by historical accounts. So it's just somebody's idea that they threw in and called it true. Um, So this 144,000 and then the innumerable multitude. And I think that's where we stopped on page 63 uh, at the innumerable multitudes, and that's a multitude in every nation that will turn to Christ during uh, this period, this lull uh, in the judgment of God. So um, the Bible says that these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and who washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So we know that they came to God uh, during the great tribulation. And it is probable that it was through the evangelistic efforts of the 144,000 Jews. Uh, And so now they're there, they're around the throne, and they hear the angels say, likewise I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents and turns to God. Um, and uh, the angels also tell John that they have washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So they came according to Jesus Christ. Everybody must come through Jesus Christ. The blood of the Lamb is the only sacrifice for sin. Uh, and the blood of Jesus Christ, First John 1 tells us, uh, his son cleanses us from all sin. Uh, I would like someone, if they would, to read uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 10. This is Sister Phyllis, and I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 2. 7 through 10, and it says, On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery which God predestined before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew it, for if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen and no ear has heard, and what has never come into a man's heart is what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, God has revealed them to us by the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the deep things of God. Word of God. Amen. Pastor? Hello? 
Did we get separated? We might have gotten kicked off like some others this morning. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. I'm I'm gonna see what I can do. He might have hit the button. Oh yeah. Easy. Mute button. Oh. But that's okay. We just wait patiently. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I forget to touch this mute button. I'm sorry. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just talking away. And I and I was hey. going okay. That's what, yeah. That's because I didn't come off mute. All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> didn't I tell you? As soon as I stood up, he would start speaking. I knew that. <laughs> All right. So we we got the we we got the First Corinthians two seven through ten. Right. We heard that. Yeah. Everybody yeah, heard that. Right? Oh, yeah. God has revealed God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things. And so what I was talking about was that we should be grateful and we are thankful that we live in the church age. It is the church age that uh, is possessed by the Holy Spirit of the living God who indwells us, who leads, teaches, guides, comforts, and keeps us uh, into the word of God and the living uh, God, Jesus Christ. So we're living in that age. We have that benefit uh, through the grace and the mercy of God and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So we, we come uh, giving praise, honor, and glory to Almighty God for his Holy Spirit that uh, is given to the church of the Lord. This innumerable multitude, I'm at the bottom of 63 now, this innumerable multitude is going to serve God day and night in his temple uh, they're going to serve in worship. And they're going to be like priests to our God. They're going to serve God day and night. Uh, that really describes, as the author says, continuous service because there's no night in heaven. Jesus uh, and the Father will be the light of heaven. Uh, believers uh, will not be floating around on clouds playing harps for all eternity, as some pictures indicate, but will be performing important duties. We will have jobs. We will have something to do that will glorify God and will keep the kingdom of God ever advancing throughout many universes, throughout many galaxies, throughout uh, many planets, throughout many situations and circumstances. We can't even begin to envision way above our pay grade, but we will be uh, in service to God one way or another. Okay, so uh, somebody will take us through Page 64, please. This is Cynthia. Is that starting? Can... Go ahead, sister. No, you go ahead. I was just wondering if we're starting at the innumerable multitude. Did we not go over that last week? Yeah, that's why nope. I'm asking where we're at. I'm sorry. I didn't think well, so, no, too. I, I thought we was on 61. Yes, but we did go over it. But we can go over it again, but we did, yeah. Okay, because this was the answer to Opal's question. Are the yes. 144,000 the only ones saved during this interim period? Uh, and the answer was no. There's going to be the 144,000, but there's also going to be this innumerable multitude that John sees. He sees a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues. They will stand before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, palms in their hands. Uh, and then the question is, who are they? And they are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. The Bible tells us they came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So they turned to Jesus Christ. So it will be not only the 144,000, uh, we believe the 144,000 will be the evangelists. They will be the ones uh, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ during the Great Tribulation. Um, and so this is the number that John sees. Uh, see them saying or singing uh, blessings and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might to our God. So... 
144,000 probably preachers, and then an innumerable multitude. John can't even begin to count all the Gentiles that will come during this interlude, this period between the, the first six seals and the final seal. Let me tell you that when, when Jesus opens the seventh seal, that's the Moten Gator. That, that's the one. You think things are bad now. When he opens the seventh seal, it's going to get a whole lot worse. Um, okay, so is any questions about the 144,000 or the innumerable multitude standing before the throne? Yes. Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. This is Sister Adrienne. Uh, this is just kind of like a little observation for myself. Those in the white robe that have washed their robes in the blood of Jesus, is that also reflecting back in the Old Testament when they used to sacrifice the lamb and they would dip a cloth in the in the blood and tie it around the doorknob and then wait for the Lord, for God to turn the, the cloth white. And then that one year when Jesus died on the cross, it no longer turned white because the salvation had died had died for the final redemption of man. So I, I guess I'm. It's, it's, yeah. This is, yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yes, it's the same type of illustration. It's the illustration that Jesus Christ is the one and only. Uh, savior of humanity, the only savior of mankind. And when the Jews used to depend on the law, when they were under the law, some of them are still under the law, when they were under the law and uh, they sent the scapegoat, as you said, they sent the scapegoat out with the sins. That was the day of atonement. The holiest of holies, when the, the high priest, only the high priest could go into the holiest of holies, he would go in and pray for himself, and then he'd pray for all of the, all the people of God. They would kill one goat uh, as a sacrifice to God. That was the blood. Then they would send a second goat, the scapegoat, out into the wilderness, um, and that was the goat that carried the sins of Israel for one year. Now, they're under the law, and they're, they're doing this under the law. And um, then they would tie that that, that uh handkerchief or a white thing, whatever you said, they would dip it in the blood of the, the goat that was sacrificed and tie it on the door to the temple, and they would all pray. And when they turned around, it was white. The blood had cleansed them and covered them. So it's the same type of thing. They were covered by the law. They were covered by the law for one year. Their sins were taken from them, and next year they had to do the same thing all over again. And the following year, the same thing all over again, until that one year when they dipped it in blood, sent out the scapegoat, and it did not turn white again. It stayed red. And this is in the Talmud. This is in the Jewish uh, uh, rabbis' record of Jewish traditions and what happened. And they have it in there. It would no longer turn white. Uh, that's because blood, the blood of animals and bulls and goats was no longer enough to cover you. It had to be the blood of Jesus who died in that year, that same year that Jesus was crucified and resurrected. The law no longer worked. If you wanted to come to God, you have to come to God through Jesus Christ. And so when he puts the white garments on, or you could use that as an illustration, when that rag stayed white, it was signifying that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life from now on, the law can't get you there. Only the grace and mercy of God through Christ Jesus. Absolutely. Can, can I ask a question that is this is not back to anybody. I, I'm, it's just me out there for a minute. The the when we get to the the verse here, First John one seven, it speaks of the light. And 
Jesus being our light, the light that's in him, as we go, one of these speaks of, uh, we, we didn't come to it yet, where the light, uh, uh, the light that's in God, that light is so bright. So when we look at people like myself, I like to wear white. I like the color white. But I never really thought of it so much as the purity of white. Where I'm trying to go is, is it like we as a people sometimes as humans, let me put it that way, as humans try and wear white as a sign of purity because that's the closest color we can get to to reflect the light of God on a human, in a human perspective. Well, that depends on where you live. That's, that's custom and tradition. Uh, you have to think about light as light. We see the light from the sun. We know what light looks like. Uh, so, yeah, if you want to get close to light, the actual light of God, it, uh, God lives in unapproachable light. So we look at, at uh, that light, and we can come to any decision about that that we want. It is bright, it is brilliant, and it is light. And some people associate, especially in places like England, America, uh, Paris, we think of that light as white, uh, uh, but it's not really. When you look at the sunshine, it's not really white. It's a light. It's a light. In, in Africa, white is a color of mourning. People wear white because they're mourning, not because they're happy or they feel good. In, in uh, Asia, in Japan, and, and other places, white is, is not uh, a happy, joyful color. It's a, it's a mourning and sorrowful color. So it depends on the, the culture you live in, the tradition you mm. come from uh, in reference to color. But light is light. We all know light. When we see light, it's light, <laughs> and it's not dark. We know the darkness is uh, is where you can't see. Things are hidden. And light is where things are open and you're able to see. And we understand that. Um, but, uh, like, to attach that to a particular color, like to say, uh, like, like we have in America, that black is dirty, bad, depressing, uh, evil, uh, morose, sorrowful, you know, that's not necessarily true of everything black uh, and that light, uh, that white, all white, wherever you see white, it's good and it's pure and it's wonderful and it's great and it's the thing to be and the thing to do. It's joyous. and That's not true of all white. Now, it's mm-hmm. true of all of the light of God, absolutely, and a darkness away from God, that is true, absolutely. Uh, but how you culturalize that? how you traditionalize that, that's up to mankind. Okay. Yeah, I say that light is bright. <laughs> I have a yes, question about is. that white and black. Is um, This is why they wear white at weddings and white for first Sunday when they do communion. In, in, in America, yes. In, in uh, many other countries, they don't do that. But our tradition, in our tradition, yes, that's why they do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, could I just want to say this, too. The reason that they do that is because they wanted to criminalize black people of color. It's part of our history. That in order to make people of color the lesser of white, the, the underdog of white, the lowest of white, they made everything negative black so that, it was, it's really, it's, it's a history lesson. But anyway, that's why they did it, to make it look like everything black was bad and everything good was mm-hmm. white. And our children mm-hmm. were, 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 you know, conditioned to that, and that's why then they made it in the dictionary and everything else, and that's how that came about. The, America mm-hmm. wanted to make everything black bad and everything white, angelic, and good. And that's why they wear black for funerals? Yes. Mm-hmm. In this country, they in do. This country only. Yes. Yeah. And it's also a European thing. And then the other thing, artists know uh, black is all colors combined to get black. White. That's right. You don't get no color with white. White is white. There's nothing in white, you know. Yeah. So 
if you look at it like that, if you have the color white as an artist, you can add anything to white and it disappears. You can't add nothing to black and get something else because it is going to stay black. You know what I'm saying? It's like I can add all my colors together and I'll get black, but you can't do that to white. And so that, but I, you know, you could take things out of black if you're really going to do it chemistry, and you can get other colors because that's the way it works. So that's one of the other things that you have to think about in terms of color. And, and that's a whole different thing away from God, so let's not go there. But yeah, it is. It is. And, and, the thing, and the thing is, and the thing is, if you were just to objectively look at this without going into polit- politicizing or, or uh, culture, uh, culturizing it, you know, Caucasians are not white, and and black people are not black. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just uh, it's just something somebody made up because Caucasians may be clear, uh, but they're not white, and and uh, black people uh, may be dark, but they're not black. So it's just a matter of, of how you uh, culturize it, how you traditionalize it. That's that, and that's what uh, Reverend Harris was talking about, and that's uh, what uh, I guess I don't know who's that Dorothea well, mentioned. It. It's just how you, uh, okay, just how you decide to use it, and you don't um, you don't really want to get caught up in that. You know, God is a God of the light. There's no question about that. And we know that light, in light, you're able to see. And in dark, you are not. That's a fact. So we deal with that, that we'd rather be in the light than in the darkness. There's no question about that. But the light is not white, and the dark is not uh, black. One is light, and one is dark. That's it. And what, what, we, also, is, what we also know, let me just say this, what we also know is that light overpowers darkness it totally overpowers it there's no way that you can be that that, that darkness can overpower light it will never it can't happen true so true that. the brightness of god is a, it, it's something we can't even fathom but we know that there's no way in the world when you if you take a, a if you light a match in a dark room you will see a lot of things you will not see without that match and that's a tiny light so imagine that magnified and, to a number we can't even envision. Mm. Exactly. And this is why Jesus Christ came saying, I am the what of the world? The light. Light. Yep. light of the world. I am the light of the world. Yes. yes. Who, he who follows me will live in that light. And he who chooses not to will live in darkness. That's the truth. He's the light of the world. And when he left to sit at the right hand of the Father, he gave that designation to us. And he did not say, well, you Caucasians, you guys are now the light of the world. He did not say, you Africans, now you are the light of the world. He did not say, you Asians, you are the light of the world. What he said was that those who follow me, you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And they're really, uh, without prejudice, there's really only one race and that's the human race. Uh, so we are all Amen. part Amen. of the glory of God who choose to follow Jesus Christ. And so we are the light of the world, regardless of your height, weight, color, gender, regardless of all of that, where, you're, where you come from, just follow Jesus Christ. Bring the love of God where you go. And, and you will be in that innumerable number that innumerable multitude around the throne of God uh, will not be for any particular race or any particular culture or any particular tradition. It will be a great multitude of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues. What makes us the light of the world is that we follow Jesus Christ. I have a, um, I don't know if it's a question. Good morning. This is Dorothea. Read in Revelation, read in the book, the the bind, um, the workbook, and then going back and forth to the Bible, I get kind of really confused because Revelation is so dark. 
um, um, God is, is he angry or why would he, why would he um, destroy people? I, I, I'm, 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 I'm totally confused because God is of love, okay? And it seems like to me is if you're not following God, you did. If you're not following God, you're going to reap whatever he's got planned for you. It's as if if you don't do what he say or if you don't follow him, you are doomed. Maybe. And that's true. <laughs> God, God is a God of love, absolutely. That doesn't mean he's not a God of justice. If you try to have love without justice, you have perversion and chaos. If you're going to love somebody with no justice, that means you're going to love them no matter what they do, evil, disgusting, terrible. Uh, the, God doesn't love like a hippie with his flowers. Um, you know, I'm going to love you no matter what you do to anybody or anything. God is just, and he goes out of his way to show his love to those who follow him. And you said it right. When you choose to not follow him, then you will be doomed. And that's the same argument I started with between Erasmus and uh, Martin Luther. If you say that I'm noble enough that I don't need God, I'm good enough that I really don't have to follow God, I can get there on my own by myself, then you are going to eventually sink into the worst deprivation that you can imagine, even that you can't imagine. And so uh, what you're saying, Deborah, is you cannot trust God and still be all right. You cannot follow God and still live a good life. God goes out of his way to give you the opportunity to follow him because it is the truth that if you do not follow God, you will not be all right. Think of it this way. You as a parent can tell your young child, don't run into traffic. Would you stop running into traffic? Would you stop running into traffic? Don't run into traffic. What I'm telling you is don't run into traffic. And the child keeps running into traffic. Sooner or later, that child is going to get hit, and he's going to be killed or maimed for life. And the thing is, God does the same thing. He loves you, but he's a God of justice. He is not going to let uh, evil prevail. If God were to let evil prevail, he would not be God. If God would have let you sink into war, would he take his hands off us and let the Antichrist have his way? What happens? We sink into war, poverty, depression, killing one another uh, uh, at a great level. Death takes over. That's when God takes his hand off and lets the Antichrist uh, come in and do his thing. And that's what will ever happen if we decide not to follow God. And so to make the decision, oh, isn't God terrible? He's killing people. You're killing yourself. And and if you're saying, oh, because we choose not to follow God, we're going to be punished, that's right. But it's not God that's punishing you. It's you that's punishing yourself because you won't grow up and understand that you must follow God because if you don't follow God, in the end, you will be depraved, defeated, and destroyed. That happens to be the truth. And if you don't accept that truth, you will discover that truth whether you want to or not. Okay, I understand that. And one thing, this is Dorothea, not Deborah. Um, oh, Dorothea, you guys sound you, alike. Yeah, we all do. <laughs> but when you, when, because I'm, I'm, know that God has this love, but then you have all these other different um, religions. So when it's rapture, okay. honey, do you, um, because they didn't fight, you got Islam, you got Buddha, you got Jehovah Witness, you have Hindu, you have all these different national uh, religions. Is he going to destroy all these people because they chose to do different religions? And if you are the creator, where did all these other religions come from? Yes. They came from mankind. That It all goes back to the same thing I said before. If you're going to create your own religion, Muhammad took the Bible and said, I like this, I'll keep this, I don't like that, I'm going to add that. That's what Muhammad did, and he came up with Islam. Buddha said, 
uh, I don't even need a Bible. I'm the great Buddha, and I'm going to tell you what I think is morally correct. And, um, and uh, there was an ethics teacher also that said, I'm going to just do ethics, and, and I will show you what I think is ethically correct. It, you have to get to the point where if it's of mankind, it is not of God. God sent a Messiah to save us, and so that's God's idea. If you want to come up with your own idea, then you're free to do that because God has given us free will. You can come up with your own idea, but every good idea is not a God idea. And so you can come up with a good idea, and it could be fine. It could take you to Star Trek. It could take you to Star Wars. It could take you to a lot of things that come from mankind. But in the end, mankind will destroy mankind because mankind has original sin. And we do not know how to elevate above original sin except through the trust of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who came by the grace and mercy of God to rescue us from ourselves. Now, what God is going to do with all these different religions, I don't know. I don't know. All I do know is that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Um, I know that uh, First Nation, Native Americans, talk about this great um, Messiah that they have. They don't use the name Jesus, but this great Messiah that they have looks just like Jesus to me. So will they be saved? I don't know. Uh, the, the, uh, the Islam teaches that Jesus Christ, that God has no son. Teaches that God has no son. So Jesus Christ can't be the Messiah. Now, for me, they have a problem. They have a problem. Because it's not what you decide religion is. It's what God's plan is. God has a plan for mankind. From Genesis chapter 3, he talks about Jesus Christ. And he talks about Jesus Christ through the whole Bible. And he also says in Revelation, anybody who changes what's written in this Bible is going to hell. And so when Muhammad took some stuff out of the Bible and left other stuff, he changed the Bible. Now, according to the Bible, he's going to hell. When the Jehovah's Witnesses and the uh, other people, the Mormons, took some of the Bible and then put other stuff in the Bible, according to John Smith um, and according to that, uh, that science fiction writer, L. Ron Hubbard, uh, and so they took some of the Bible and put their other stuff in there according to what the Bible says, they're going to hell. That's John says if you change anything in the word of God, um, then you will get the curses that are written in the word of God. Now, that's how I look at it. My thing is this. I'm going to humble myself and accept God's plan. Now, if you or anyone else want to accept mankind's plan, that's up to you, and that's between you and God. But I've decided to follow Jesus because that's, the, that's God's plan. And I'm going to humble myself underneath the authority of the Messiah who came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Uh, Muhammad, four generations after the Bible. Buddha, uh, you know, didn't look at the Bible. He just wanted to do a morality that came to him. And uh, the, the ethics teachers, they just thought this was a noble thing, like Erasmus. Uh, this is a noble thing. Mankind is noble, and mankind can do great things. And, and to me, it all goes back to 666. I'm depending on man alone. And so the only criteria I say is that you either trust God or you trust mankind. I choose to trust God. So do I. Amen. 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 Harris, could I say this, please? Um, yes. One of the ways that I remember it, and I try to always look at no matter what's going on, like I talk to my kids about, is that when, when we, whatever we do, we have to understand that sin has its own consequences. My kids used to say, well, Ms. Harris, why does this happen? Why does that happen? Why did God allow it? God doesn't allow that. Sin has its own consequences. When you decide to follow yourself and other men, then what happens is not, that's, God's not doing that. When you decide to do, and we and want, and on this line, we're learning to recognize God's way, and we're learning to recognize the tools of the devil. And when you know that you know that you know what those are, and then you go outside of that, then you can't blame that on God. 
Because once you know who, what, the, what the signs are, once you know what God's way is, and once you know what the world's way is, and you choose to follow the world's way, and something happens to you, or something happens to your child, or anybody, you can't say God did that, because God didn't do that. Sin has its own consequences. So that's why we need, I, I appreciate this line, that we can learn to recognize and be, be known in our hearts and our, our, our consciousness. God, the Holy Spirit reveals to us what God's way is, and what the, what the world's way is, and when we choose the world's way, know that whatever happens, sin has its own consequences, and that has nothing to do with God. Amen. Mm. That's right. Well, that's, 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 that's an important point. That. That's important. Mm-hmm. Yes. Thank you all for that, for the clarification. Thank for you clarity. for um, clarifying. I'm just really trying to... You know, that revelation is scary. It's very scary. Um, it makes you think three times, not twice. It, well, it makes you think three times. So, but it's just, uh, uh, the love that he has for him to have that other devastation thing. And I look out for other people, too. You know, they choose, they may not choose to believe what I believe or believe in Jesus Christ, but I still love them people. Uh, and, and, and to see what is going to happen to them is just sad. I, 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 and I can't explain it any kind of way to them. I, I really don't. I really can't. It's, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm just confused right now. And think Never about that me. now. Look how sad that makes you. Now, can you imagine how sad that makes God? And that's why he bends over backwards, even through the time of judgment, to bring others unto the truth. Uh, don't, don't you think it breaks his heart that people will refuse to turn and humble themselves when the truth of the matter is every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus the Christ is Lord? Don't you think that he wants people to turn, that even in the midst, that we have this seventh chapter, this interlude where he's giving uh, chances to an innumerable, John can't even count the number of Gentiles who turned the right way uh, through the preaching and teaching of this 144,000. Don't you know how sad God feels that people still want to go their own way, even in the midst of judgment, and he gives every opportunity way beyond what we would do. See, I'm not afraid or, or upset at reading Revelation. I am glad and glorified and happy at a God who loves so much that he refuses to judge us if we would uh, understand that he is God and that we are not. He, his grace and his mercy saved us even though we didn't deserve it. Now, I don't know about you, but I know I didn't deserve it. I know that I did not deserve to be saved. I know that I should have went to hell, but I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven because my God loved me just that much, and he loves you and each of us just that much. If you would just uh, come under the understanding that he is God and you are not, and that's real. One and one is two. You can want it to be four or you want. You can want it to be 17 or you want. But one and one is going to be two whether you like it or not. Uh, just like the illustration I gave uh, earlier about a play in traffic, your child playing in traffic and all the cars are coming. Um, like Min- uh, Reverend Harris said, uh, if a car hits that child, that's not God's fault. That's the child's fault for continually playing in traffic, continually going somewhere where you shouldn't go, doing things that you shouldn't do. I mean, the truth is the light, and the light has to shine. One and one is going to be two. I don't care if you like it or not. Energy equals MC times the speed of light squared. That's a fact, whether you believe it or not. And so in this instance when God is saying Jesus Christ is Lord, the Messiah, and we can read it from Genesis to Revelation. That's the truth. That's the word of God. You can either accept it or not, but even when you don't accept it, God comes after you. He comes after you to show you the error of your ways, even in judgment. Even in judgment, he's showing people the error of their ways and giving them an opportunity to turn because it's not that we deserve it. It's that he is so good. 
So when I read Revelation, I am gratified to know that our God is so good. He goes after those who don't believe. He goes after those who don't know. He goes after those who've chosen the wrong road. He goes after all of these people and tries to get them to turn around, repent, and be saved in the name of Jesus. And it is only those who refuse to turn, who who are so stubborn, who are, I am so sure that I am right, like uh, Ronald Reagan's son. He says, Ronald Reagan's son says, I'm not scared of hell. Uh, I don't believe in uh, that when I die, I'm going to go to hell. And so I'm going to live my life as an atheist, and that's just who I am. And there are millions of people like that. And so what God gives you is the opportunity to turn, to turn to him. He gave us free will, and he will not take it back. You have the opportunity. That's what separates us from the animals. We have free will. God gave us free will, and we, are, we can turn or we can burn. And that's just the way it is. Uh, and he gives us every opportunity to come unto him just as we are. He's a loving God, but he is not without justice. He will not cause, uh, not cause the earth to stand still because you refuse to trust God. Well, I'm glad I turned and I won't be burned. Amen. This is Deborah. I am so glad that um, everybody is asking these questions and you are giving these answers <laughs> because some things are confusing, but um, I'm glad that I'm a child of God. I know that. And I agree with you. And you I don't find many things hope. confusing. Yes, and I and I hope and I pray for my family and my friends and my frenemies, <laughs> you know, because it is rough and it is going to be crazy. But you're right. God has given um, us, every one of us, a lot of more chances than we would give each other. So I, yes. that's love right there because we, as in human beings, we will give up on each other quickly. And in a hurry, if it don't satisfy us, we will give up on each other. But God, he does not give up on you. You give up on him. He does not Amen. give up on you. And I know that. And I said, and I am so glad that he does not give up on me. So I am not Amen. giving up on him. And the, and the thing is, we, we have that blessed hope uh, in Christ Jesus. And so let us pray. Let's close there today. We'll pick up on page 64 on tomorrow and understanding that God loves us. And so, Lord God, we are so grateful to be loved by God. We are so grateful that in the midst of a terrible situation uh, like what will happen in the wrath of God, that we have been saved from the day of God's wrath. We have been saved because we have chosen Jesus Christ out of the world as our Lord and Savior. We are sealed and we are witnesses. We are now the light of the world and uh, the salt of the earth. We represent uh, the love of God in Christ Jesus. And yes, our hearts are sad. And yes, our minds are confused by all of these things that uh, only God has direct knowledge of. Uh, But Lord God, I am so grateful uh, that we walk by faith and not by sight. For if we walked by uh, sight, we would be confused. If we walked by sight, we would not have an answer. If we walked by sight, we wouldn't know which way to turn. But thanks be to God, we walk by faith and not by sight. We come trusting the word of God. We come believing in the leading of the Holy Ghost to Jesus Christ our Lord. We come knowing that you are God all by yourself. And though you sit high, you look low, and you're willing to bring all who will come in to the house of the Lord. And we pray for those who think it not right to come to the Lord our God, and those who are tricked, hoodwinked, and bamboozled by the illusions of the enemy. And we ask you, O God, to continue to do those things that will cause multitudes to turn, whatever it takes. If it's through mercy and grace, as you're doing with the church, And kindness, thank you for the multiple millions that will come through that. If it is through judgment and horror that some stubborn, hard-headed people will be the only way they will see it, give it to them, Lord God, that they will also turn 
and be in the innumerable multitude uh, that come to the throne of God. Whatever you need to use, O oh God, to turn people unto you, we say, yes, God, uh, because the result is that millions upon millions upon millions upon multiple millions will be saved, whether it's by grace or it's by judgment. You, God, love us enough to show us what we need to turn and be saved. And those who refuse must accept the place that they place themselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. 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 Thank you for the lesson. This is Judith Hines. Amen. Amen.